by just reinforcing the basics of using a sound in that moment instead of the gravity, we start to change the child's perception of what it is that they need to do to get the things they want. The actions don't work for me anymore, but vocal sounds will. When I go, ah, I, I'm more likely to get it. Then we start, as the time goes by, the child starts to come to us going, ah, ah. Well, now we have to start to change what our expectations are of what we accept. And ah becomes, they start to say, ah. And so instead of saying, oh, oh, ball, here you go, we now start to say, oh, wait. And we put ah on extinction, and we say, now we give a prompt. Ball, ball, child goes, ah, ball, ah, ball, ba, yeah, ball. <laughs> there you go. And we slowly start to change the expectations. And the child is learning, oh, hitting and grabbing no longer gets me it. Using sounds does. Well, now using any sound no longer gets to me. Now I have to use a sound similar to the one they're saying. So then they start for the first time in their lives, sometimes when we start working with kids at 8 and 10 and 12 and 16 years old, they will start for the very first time in their lives looking to us and listening to what we have to say because that is what leads them to their reinforcement as opposed to the rest of their life where it didn't matter what we said, um, they didn't know how to react, they didn't know what the expectation was going to be, they didn't know what the reinforcement was going to be. For them, the one way they knew they were going to get it is if they could trick you and steal it. And that's what the kids end up doing. They get really good at tricking you and stealing it. You know, they knock over something over here, and then when you go over to pick that up, then they're off playing with what they want to begin with. Um, and they become, and if you don't understand these things and use them, what happens to our kids with autism is because I believe that 90% that of the kids with autism are extremely bright. You know, I think there's probably maybe 10% of the kids that still have mental retardation or what we call developmental delay, the same as the regular population. You used to believe that you know, 70, 80% of kids with autism had developmental delay. But I think that the, the better they've been able to assess um, intelligence, and the more we've been able to really look at the studies that were used, I think we're finding more and more that it's now believed to be more about the normal population. That these kids are extremely intelligent. At least some of them are extremely intelligent. The problem is, is they're using their intelligence to outsmart the environment around them. Or the environment around them is allowing them to use their intelligence to consistently get things the way that they want them. Now, don't get me wrong. By no means am I saying that this is a, a parental failing or a teacher's failing. I'm not saying that parents are bad parents and that's why kids are becoming autistic. Not in the slightest. These kids have different motivations than we're used to. The th same things that I did to teach my daughter Zoe how to grow and learn and, and develop the way that she's growing and learning and developing, if I did those exact same wonderful things with a child with autism, chances are it's not going to work. What's typically used as parents and teachers is just not going to work because the motivations are different. The child is so much more motivated by things that we can't understand. Because we don't understand them, we don't know how to apply um, any kind of consequence to them in the right way. Because the child doesn't want to run the car down the track. What the child wants to do is bang the car on the track or spin the wheel. And so we, we sit down and say, oh, let's play. And the child grabs the car and starts ramming it on their head. And we say, oh, don't do that. That's not playing. Come here. You've got to do this. Boom, boom, boom. And before we know it, we wanted to play, and instead we were teaching. And as soon as the child says, you know what? I don't want to learn. I want to play. And if you're not going to let me do this with the car, well, I'm just going to go somewhere else. And we find ourselves constantly dealing with the child. We look at the child like this, and the child turns away. And then so we chase after the child, and then they learn how to they run away. And then they learn how to come back only when we're getting them what they want. Oh, hey, I'll do whatever you say. Okay, now I'll come be with you. And then as soon as I want something from you, boom, child's gone again. <laughs> and we lose access to them. And it's funny, but it's so true. Because as teachers, if you've got that right toy or that right game or that right candy, they'll come over and they'll engage with you. But as soon as you start saying, say, ah, not interested. I'll do my own thing over here. No problem. And what we've got to learn how to do is, is turn that Diane, that, that that paradigm around, what we call turning the tables on autism. And if you look, I did write a book uh, back in 2006. Um, and the flyers that you have here um, have just some information about the book. But the book is called Educate Toward Recovery. Not the idea that all kids should be recovered or can be recovered, or that recovery means cure. I don't really have time to get into all that. But what I basically am saying is that we can teach kids with autism. We know this is a fact. And through ABA, there's a lot of things we can do to teach them a lot of skills. The question is, is when we teach them these skills, are we teaching them in ways that's going to cause them to have more sophisticated, more successful future lives? 
or are we just teaching them to follow rote routines and things that we need them to do to get them through the day? Because if that's all we're teaching them, then we're not teaching them toward the recovery of the diagnosis. What we want to be doing is teaching them in a way that's causing them not only to learn the individual skills, but to learn the reasons behind the skills and why they would use them and when they would use them and how to use them and to want to, get, to have our attention, to try to work to hang on to our attention using things like eye contact or initiation of language, the kind of things that we all do to, to have those things. So when I talk about educating toward recovery, I don't mean that, that all kids can be recovered, all kids should be recovered or anything like that. I just mean that when we teach, it needs to be grander in scope than teaching the individual skill. That everything we do needs to lead towards the idea of this child becoming a more independent adult and able to use these skills in more successful ways. And it's really well explained in the book, the differences. And for me, um, one of the things I found when I first started doing ABA was that a lot of traditional style ABA, the early stuff based on the early LOBA stuff, um, was really good at reinforcing behaviors in the moment, at the table, in the situation, but that those behaviors weren't turning into children being more successful in life in a lot of ways. That, and that because of that, a lot of people lost interest in ABA early on in Europe. Back in the 60s and 70s, some of the techniques that were being used, using punishment procedures and other things made people say, ooh, yeah, I don't like ABA, I don't want to use that with my kid because they're just, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're making the child do something and if they don't want to do it, they make them do it anyway and then they throw candy at the child and then if the child, uh, you know, tries to get up, they'll slap the child on the leg or they'll spray him with water. And in the very early days of ABA where people were just starting to understand the principles and were starting to apply it, they did it very scientifically. They did it like with a white lab coat. You see the guy with the, with the clipboard, the white lab coat, can come in and say, okay, what happens when I spray him with water? Oh, he doesn't do it anymore. Well, let's spray him with water. That's what we'll do now when he does it, when we get a problem. And that's not appropriate to do with children. I don't believe that that's an appropriate way to teach anyone. Luckily, as time went on and the study of ABA progressed, we started realizing that there's, there's lots of different ways that these behavioral principles can be applied. And there's lots of nuances and there's things that are more appropriate than others, things that work better than others. And what I think has really happened, especially in the verbal behavior approach, is that in verbal behavior ABA, we've taken the science of ABA out of the hands of the scientists who are just you know, interested in getting the result only, um, but we're putting it into the hands of teachers with the sensitivity of teachers who are trying to teach the child to be as fully um, realized as a human being as they can possibly be by utilizing these principles, this, this SMO prompts and this reinforcement and punishment or extinction, knowing how and when to use those things so that we can help the child to really motivate themselves to want to do special things.